right now. Um, and uh, Dr. Uh, also, Sai Professor and Michael uh, has co-authored edited collections, including language and literacy, personal approaches, and advancing in language and education. Um, and another book is a functional linguistic perspective on developing language. And she also a member of the UIM CLIL research group. We carry out applied linguistic research on content and language integrated learning in school setting. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor and Mike K, um, for um, uh, supporting the SPLACE group for so many years. And um, for uh, your Leary speech today, we can't wait to hear from you. Um, thank you, Lynn, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, and there we go. And I'd like to thank you, Lynn, and all of the organizing committee for this wonderful second um International Online Systemic Functional Linguistics Interest Group Conference. I think the energy coming out of this group is amazing. And I know it's because of your leadership and your wonderful organizing team. So I thank you for this invitation. It's an honor to be here to speak to everybody. And um, I, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. I have to say good morning from Madrid. <laughs> So it's 7.30 a.m. here in Madrid. I know it's the end of the day for you all. So we've got some very different energy systems going on here. Um, and so let's just get into the talk. Well, let's talk about the context first. I just said, here I am in Madrid, Spain, in the very center of the country. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about Madrid's bilingual program. Uh, Spain has a decentralized public education system. So each autonomous community region um, sets up their own educational uh, structure. And Madrid since 2004 has been teaching um, language through a system of um, teaching subject matter through a foreign language. And that is going back to Spain's traditionally uh, poor results in language learning. Um, and you know, it, students would take a foreign language at school. It used to be French in the past. At some point it switched to English. Um, but you know, every year they would kind of start all over again with the verb to be. And so, you know, they, they came up with the idea of um, content and language integrated learning or a bilingual education program. So in 2004, they started with 26 primary schools. In 2010, more primary schools had joined, but there were like 30 secondary schools. And fast forward to 2023, where you can see there are over 400 primary and almost 200 secondary schools in the region involved in teaching children uh, subject matter through foreign languages. Um, so that's over, or it's around 50% of all of the state education uh, institutions in the um, Madrid region. So that's reaching over 200,000 students. Uh, subjects taught through the foreign language include everything except math and Spanish language, obviously. Um, and the vast majority of the programs uh, teach the subjects through English. There are a few uh, French, a few German, um, and maybe one or two Italian, but the vast majority are English. Uh, general attitudes towards the program sometimes can be very negative. Uh, there are there is this sentiment that's expressed that it's a hoax, the children learn neither English nor the subjects. And then there are the defenders of the program, but those who say that what's needed is more comprehensive linguistic scaffolding and content subjects in order to uh, implement CLIL successfully in Spanish schools. And so obviously, uh, a linguistic scaffolding is needed. Uh, subject atti teacher attitudes, and this is coming out of interview research by uh, Isabel Alonso Belmonte and Maria Fernandez Agüero, 
Um, what they found was, you know, the 10 out of 13 content teachers who they interviewed contrast the subject content with the language instruct instruction. And they view the language as a separate entity that could interfere with daily practice. And so there often is this negative attitude towards having to teach their content through uh, another language. And so um, the UAMCLIL, that stands for the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, the Autonomous University of Madrid uh, research group has been uh, studying the project almost since they started, since 2006. Uh, and there's been an ongoing analysis of student output, primary and secondary schools, um, based on guided oral and written tests, but there has been no intervention. Um, and, you know, this, this research has taken place across subjects, across languages, across modes over time. So seeing what the children are able to produce in a foreign language, all the research we've done has been on English. Uh, some workshops have been carried out with teachers from across the curriculum uh, using a comparative judgment a technique uh, of st student work, student output, plus guided conversation with the teachers. So in the talk today, I'm going to be showing you some analysis of the student output, both oral and written, uh, using systemic functional linguistics and cognitive discourse functions, and I'll be explaining those. Uh, shortly. And we'll see results of a couple of the project studies. And we'll also be seeing some of the conversations with teachers, including that comparative judgment of cognitive discourse functions and cooperative design of text. And they're going to be intertwined, these topics, um, throughout the talk today. And uh, again, uh, the idea is to think about how our SFL-based research on cognitive discourse functions can then be taken into the classroom and taken to the teachers to give them ways of talking about uh, content and languages integrated so then that they have some of that scaffolding that they need when they go in to teach their subjects. And I just would like to give a shout out here to, of course, all of the schools involved, the teachers, the students, the heads of the schools, and the work I'll be reporting on uh, with respect to the conversations with teachers was carried out by Ana Yinares, who is the principal investigator of the projects coming out of the uh, UAM CLIL research group, as well as Rachel, Rachel Whitaker and Tom Morton. So, um, we're all familiar, I think, in this room with um, Michael Halliday's work on language and education. And this quote uh, captures our view of the role of language in learning beautifully. Language is the essential condition of knowing, the process by which experience becomes knowledge. And so, of course, we don't see that separation that the content teachers are seeing between content and language. You know, we can talk about the language of history, we can talk about the language of science, and of course, systemic functional linguistics has given us many, many tools to be able to talk about uh, content and language in that way. Uh, so, of course, we see CLIL, or Content and Language Integrated Learning, as the norm for all learning in first, second language or multilingual contexts across all curriculum areas and at all levels of education, primary, secondary, tertiary, and beyond throughout our lives. Uh, we learn, we grow through language. And so we do see this happy marriage between SFL and CLIL. Now, uh, a lot of the work, uh, educational work in SFL has taken place at the text level with genres. I think we're all very familiar with that work and then how we can take it down to the lexical grammatical level uh, and then build back up to the level of genre. However, we're working at a, a different focus of analysis and that's these key uses of academic language or cognitive discourse functions. 
Uh, and I'll go on to explain those now um, and give you the basis for the cognitive discourse functions. Uh, this is coming out of work by Christiane Dalton Puffer at the University of Vienna. Um, she herself is a linguist and uh, her department was joined with an education department. And so she started realizing that she needed a way to have conversations with education uh, specialists in her institution. And so she went to the educational literature and started to sift through things like Bloom's Taxonomy of Cognitive Functions, um, all the work by the Council of Europe on languages across the curriculum, and then from the linguistic perspective, so that was more from the educational through the language perspective, and then on to a linguistic perspective, um, sifting in linguistic theory, speech acts, systemic functional linguistics. And through all of this work that she did, um, she revised and distilled numerous taxonomies and nomenclatures uh, to come up with seven manageable cognitive discourse functions. And uh, you can see the different types on the left of the screen and on the right is the overall label uh, that she has given um, the, the discourse function. Uh, originally categorized was classified, but through classroom research and applying um, the construct to student output, both oral and written, and you know, she revised the uh, label to categorize. So it does include classify, compare, et cetera. So you can see the seven types there on the screen and uh, the different labels that each of the types uh, has been given. We can also think about them in terms of their communicative intention. So I tell you how we can cut up the world according to certain ideas, about the extension of this object of specialist knowledge, details of what can be seen, what my position is, reasons for, causes of some potential, um, or about something that is external to our immediate context. So these can be understood as the discursive representation of both the cognitive process and their linguistic realization in the sense of enact enactment brought into play for the, develop the development or exposition of knowledge. So it's both the knowing and the expressing. And as uh, Christiane puts it, the construct of CDF's link subject specific cognitive learning goals with their linguistics representations uh, in classroom interaction. And uh, the question often comes up uh, when we talk about our work, why have we not focused on genre? And uh, Christiane Dalton Puffer through her work does look carefully at systemic functional linguistics as the most apt linguistic theory to be applied to education. Uh, but she also does say, uh, that a school lesson could certainly be characterized as an interactional process that unfolds in recognizable stages. On the other hand, classroom discourse, she has found the oral discourse especially, is far too complex and multifaceted to seriously count as one genre uh, of the kind that has been studied in detail by genre analysts. And uh, we can also connect this to work by Jay Lemke and Koitsi Lachman uh, connects to this, not directly from cognitive discourse functions, but something that it is, is at a level that is different from uh, the genres in terms of the staged uh, uh, goal-oriented structures that, that we have studied uh, using systemic functional linguistics. Um, you know, and, and Lemke talks about something like the relation of question to answer and is, is a slightly more abstract level and other patterns like this problem solution, cause consequence, generalization example. Um, those are patterns that are widely used across many different genres and language using activities. 
Um, he goes on to say, we can think of these as mini genres that are used to fill the functional slots of the major genres. They are certainly structures in their own right, though typically they only have two or three functional elements of their own. It is useful to recognize that they are more abstract than genres or activity structures proper. Uh, and that because of this fact, they can be used in different genres while retaining their own basic structure. And he calls them rhetorical structures. And I think we can think about something like definitions here, uh, in addition to the examples that uh, Lemke gives. And we'll go on to be seeing, you know, what those two or three little functional elements might be uh, in a couple of the different cognitive discourse functions. Um, so why not genre, why CDFs? Um, so Tom Morton writes about three kinds of knowledge, language, literacy, and content. And knowledge and literacy includes knowledge of genres, understanding of genres. And so then he places cognitive discourse functions at the center of this three circle Venn diagram consisting of literacy, content and language. Uh, and so, you know, the, the cognitive discourse functions are an abstraction that can bring them all together and make them very useful for conversations in content and language integrated learning contexts. So, uh, you know, we can also realize that systemic functional linguistics allows us beautifully to characterize the different cognitive discourse functions. Uh, you know, we can think about them, uh, especially in terms of um, their discourse semantics, but then going down to the lexical grammar. Uh, so we have used several different uh, systemic functional linguistic descriptors uh, to characterize the cognitive discourse functions as expressed by the children in their written and oral production uh, from the, the bilingual schools. Things like verbal processes, uh, types of nominal groups, constructing different kinds of participants. We can use appraisal from the interpersonal metafunction, um, things like modalization for explore and um, uh, we could use theme, though we've not done that yet, um, because we are use, looking at smaller chunks of language, often within a, a larger um, response to a prompt, and I'll be showing you those shortly. So we think that CDFs provide a level of abstraction that allows researchers and teachers from different disciplines across the curriculum to build understandings from the bottom up. So understandings about how language constructs their content uh, from the bottom up, from their classroom experience. So rather than going in with descriptions of language, we go in with thinking about cognitive discourse functions and then how those are constructed through language. And then, uh, I'm gonna speak a little bit now about what the teachers uh, were involved in after we had described the different cognitive discourse functions, uh, characterize them using systemic functional linguistics. The teachers were asked to do a comparative judgment exercise. Comparative judgment is coming out of um, this no more marking um, that's big in the UK. Uh, so rather than assessing something uh, according to a rubric, um, participants, in this case teachers, are given two examples of something and asked to choose which one they think is best. So teachers in our study would see, for example, and these are examples from the student output, it was better to be a patrician because you had more privilege and power, or I would like to be a patrician because I could change the things too good on the empire. Uh, you know, we'd see the students struggling with the, the language itself, but the meanings are there. And teachers would choose which one they thought was better. Then they would get another two responses and another two responses and another two responses. And obviously 
E and F would be compared also throughout the exercise with other responses. Um, and so they're always comparing and choosing the best. So it's a holistic kind of activity. Uh, and so this is doing multidisciplinary assessment because uh, teachers would be getting examples from history, from science and from art. And then once that exercise is all done and numerous teachers have um, done this activity with numerous responses, then uh, they're ranked uh, based on all of their comparisons. So you have an example here of a ranking. Uh, obviously, we uh, not all of the responses are included. So this just gives you an example of the range. A zero means that this first one was never chosen as uh, the best response. The 100 means that every time that G appeared, it was chosen as, as the best response. So we'll be seeing a, a and G again as, as we move through the talk, but that's a little bit about a comparative judgment that then the teachers can use to discuss which response is better. So in focus groups led by Anna, Tom and Rachel, the teachers discussed those responses. So they were doing interdisciplinary assessment. So they were discussing E and F. It was better to be a patrician because you had more privilege and power, or I would like to be a patrician because I could change the things to good on the empire. Now notice that those were ranked very close to each other, F coming out slightly before E. Uh, so the researcher asked, why would F be higher? Higher. And um, a history teacher said for the values which it inspires. An English teacher said because he wants to change the Roman Empire from within, he wants to imp improve society from within. Spanish teacher said for us, it is well positioned. English teacher, yes, that's why she is awarded. Notice that they don't know the gender of the writer. Obviously, um, the, the responses were anonymized because she wants to do something good because it's very moral, right? Yes, she's the only one who wants to take advantage of the situation. It's interesting that you marked it as the best and it's because of values. And we'll be coming back to values again. So again, this allowed for these interdisciplinary discussions about uh, um, something in history and why the teachers would choose that one as, as better. So I'm gonna go back to our text analysis. Uh, because then that's going to form the basis of some input into those teacher discussions. So our overall uh, focus questions on all of these projects, and there is a new one that's ongoing now, um, which cognitive dis function, discourse functions are realized and how are they realized in terms of lexical grammar? And that's the main question we want to focus on here. So how did we collect data to be able to answer that question? Well, students were given a prompt. And in this case, they were asked to write a blog in which they traveled in time to the past. So they were asked to define the age that they chose to travel to, write about what they did after they got there, describe what they saw, compare with life today, um, then choose an important person, event, or invention, why it or they were important, what would life be like today if this had not had happened, to elicit, explore, uh, in your opinion, which time period changed our lives more and why, so that they would have uh, provide an explanation. Uh, so the data in the project that's been collected so far, and actually the, the very new project, we have collected more data and that's not on this, uh, uh, slide, but you can see we're very data rich, um, including, you know, written and spoken output. We also do have classroom recordings, questionnaires to get at those attitudes of student teachers involved in the bilingual schools project. We also have test results at the end of primary. So in Spanish school system, students are in primary school up through grade six when they're 11 and 12. Then they go into secondary school for four years. Um, and so they finish when they're 15, 16. And then there are two further years prior to going on to university. All, this is the compulsory 
compulsory uh, education uh, cycle in Spain. So what we did was we divided up into pairs and we analyzed and discussed in pairs. And then our questions, we would take back to the team uh, of the cognitive discourse function that each pair was working on. I'm, I'm very familiar with Evaluate and so I'll be presenting a little more on that later. And that's work I did with Rachel Whitaker. And to do the analysis, we used Mick O'Donnell's corpus tool. And you can see here an example of uh, the application of appraisal to uh, a text. And uh, I'll be saying more about that very soon as I'm going to go on to show you just a brief uh, summary of how we replied, how we applied, uh, appraisal to the cognitive discourse function of evaluate. And then we'll go on to look at define briefly and then go back to um, talking to the teachers. So evaluate, oh, you might ask why the fish bowls. Um, it's to indicate when we have a comparison that's across modes, across students of the same year, across languages and uh, these fish bowls moving from smaller bowl to a larger bowl are longitudinal studies. So we have a longitudinal and uh, cross-sectional study here where um, we follow the same 11 students from year six through year 10, writing in history and English. Uh, and then we followed a different set of 11 students writing about history in Spanish. But these students, the ones writing in Spanish were in the bilingual schools program. In fact, they're from the same schools, but uh, the problem is in our first year of data collection in year six, in history, students wrote either in English or in Spanish, and that's why we couldn't follow the same 11 students uh, through um, the years. Uh, but uh, you know, we do see here a significant increase in output, uh, students writing in Spanish. And I'll say something more about writing in Spanish later uh, in the subjects that have been taught through the foreign language. So that's the data uh, we analyzed. How did we analyze it? Well, we use the appraisal framework, appreciation, judgment, affect. Um, and I think we're all familiar with the appraisal framework and the examples there are from year 10. Now, what we realized through our analysis of the children's evaluations was that, uh, as Caroline Coffin says, um, that students often experience difficulty in assessing the validity of different perspectives on the past as well as in justifying their own. And as um, Martin Maiton Matruglio point out, history is not just about what happened in the past, it's also about how we evaluate what happened. You have to have the right values as well as the right knowledge in order to succeed. So we realize that part of the profile of an evaluative proposition in school writing includes coupling resources from the interpersonal metafunction of language with resources from the ideational metafunction in the form of disciplinary knowledge as justification. And let's unpack that a little bit and use some examples to see what we mean. So the couplings, the attitude, I think it would be better to be a patrician, plus then the justification, why? Why do I say that? Because they had all the rights, control the government, and they didn't have to pay taxes. Now again, we're seeing, remember this was the one that was always chosen as um, high, on the scale. And this is from year eight. So uh, students are in their second year of primary school. They're 13, 14 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they've they been asked to write about ancient Rome. And so this was the part of responding to the part of the prompt that asked if they thought it was better to be a patrician or a plebeian. But not all students, uh, and again, we can see the use of disciplinary knowledge there. Not all students are able to do that, as we saw in our study. 
Um, remember, this one was always judged the worst. I think it's much better to be a plebeian because we're the best. So using the interpersonal, an attitude to uh, support an attitude. Uh, the other example that was not rated high, nor did we rate it high, I prefer to be a patrician because I would have a lot of free time. So that's taking the students own everyday knowledge about life now to say what they thought would be better uh, rather than using disciplinary knowledge. And so, you know, we can think about this, um, how and Humphrey have written on it as well, Jing Hao and Sally Humphrey, this combination of ideation and attitude, and, you know, thinking about how fields vary along these dimensions of technicality. You know, common sense, everyday knowledge, learned through personal experiences. We did find this, for example, this is the first year a primary school. I don't like the people who threw food or toys to the ocean. Uh, this is from secondary, traveling in time to the past. Their clothes were poor clothes and horrible clothes. Sorry, did I say secondary? I didn't mean primary. So again, describing life through what they're familiar with. Um, but disciplinary knowledge, as we know, is learned through schooling. And it does involve um, you know, different entities, different fields have different entities like history, expansion, consequences, crises, conflicts. And then there are dimensions of those entities. So social crisis, political conflicts, um, and entities can also be evaluated. And there we can, can combine attitude with the disciplinary knowledge with ideation in something like negative consequences. So um, we expanded the appraisal framework to include a, a special category for when the students included a justification with their expression of attitude. Um, and there are examples here on the slide of each of the different kinds. This one we found interesting, women fought during the revolution where you get the evidence before you get the expression of evaluation, the expression of attitude, in this case, of judgment. And that we did not see until year 10. So we wondered, were there differences over time in evaluating in history? Do they develop discipline appropriate couplings? Are there differences between uh, writing in uh, the second language and in the first language. And this is all with no explicit teaching. Now, these are the prompts that were designed to uh, prompt the uh, cognitive discourse function of evaluate. Although we did analyze four expressions of evaluation throughout the student's texts. And we coded all of the evaluative meanings in the text. So I'm just going to give you a brief summary of some of the findings. By year 10, uh, we found that students clearly showed an increase in those 11 students, number and type of evaluative meanings. So this is per 1,000 words, but again, we're talking about 11 texts, but there are far more um, justifications in year 10 than in year 6. <laughs> They used a greater range of linguistic resources to encode appreciation. So what we saw in year six and year eight were a lot of epithets and attributes. In year 10, we saw more clauses and nominal groups, those entities that I mentioned earlier, social inequality, equality, improvement, evolution, poverty, a series of economical inequalities. And again, we're not seeing um, a perfect grasp of the language itself. Um, but rather the meanings are there and expressed through nominalizations. So there's a move, and there's also a move away from writing about personal affect into other affect. And what do I mean by that? Here you can just see an example of all of the affect plus justification that were included. Now, obviously a lot of this is um, conditioned by the prompt the students were given. We're, we're aware of that. Uh, you know, I prefer to be, I would like to be. But again, I did mention that we analyzed for uh, the evaluative meanings across the text. And what we, we have one example, he looks scared 
and he was writing about gladiators, um, where in year 10, uh, it's all other affects. Society was fed up, everyone was unhappy, uh, even anomalization, there was a lot of discontent. Okay, created a huge discontent in the population. Um, people feared death. Okay, so there was that change across the years in the writing. Students also provide uh, attitude evaluations plus justification that demonstrate more historical evidence. And again, this is just, um, these are all of the examples of appreciation plus justification. Um, you know, things like you live better. Uh, there, are, there obviously is uh, historical evidence here. Um, although some of it is a little vague, all will change if Columbus didn't found America. Um, and in year 10, again, there's a lot more. And there are, you know, more examples of historical evidence where we can see those entities uh, like power and taxes and poverty and, um, you know, all of those uh, entities that the students need to be able to include in their responses to construct uh, an evaluation that's justified using uh, historical evidence. Um, and I won't show you the results for Spanish just in interest of time, but despite having studied history and English, the, the students wrote a, a wide range of expressions to encode attitudinal meanings in Spanish, um, as well as the historical evidence. So they were able to do both in Spanish with no problem. A lot of parents are worried that their children are not going to be able to express the content in Spanish um, but they obviously have enough exposure to the language um, that they can express the meanings in their first language. Now we're going to look at define, and we're going to look at this across students of the same year rather than longitudinally. And uh, so this is looking at mode. Um, and so how students define in the same field ecosystems in English and Spanish. So we have across languages, we have across mode, spoken and written. So the students were asked to define ecosystem as part of a blog entry when they were writing. And uh, they also participated as if they were speakers on a radio show um, interviewed by the researchers and they were asked to define ecosystem. So um, this is the data uh, from that larger data set that I showed you earlier that um, Nashwa Nashat Sobi and Ana Yinares used to uh, analyze the text for definitions. And this was their construct to uh, analyze for definitions on work by John Trimble combined with systemic functional linguistic descriptions. So a formal definition as a term, an ecosystem, a class, is a community, and then the character, which, so it is an identifying relational process, and then uh, the characteristics that uh, describe and differentiate the term, exemplification, classification, so expansions, for example, using attributive relational processes. A semi-formal definition um, it is not exactly an identifying relational process because it often will leave out the term. So it's like something rather than it is something. Uh, and so in their study, what they found was that there were no differences across languages. Again, the students can express these meanings in their first language, even though they're not learning through their first language. Uh, there were differences across modes in English. There were significantly more formal definitions in written text, significantly more semi-formal definitions in the spoken performance, but they would expand more in when they spoke. So they would give more examples, more explanations, um, et cetera. There were more class words, so more uh, formal definitions, as we said, in the written. And in Spanish, there were similar tendencies as in English. Uh, and what this speaks to is the need for those conversations in the classroom where students are given the, that 
those opportunities to expand on what they mean by their formal definitions, and then thinking about legitimation code theory and semantic waves packing back up into the more formal definitions. But again, this work has given us ways then to go back to the classroom to show the teachers um, what the children can do and how we can help them do that. So we think that the systemic functional descriptions of cognitive discourse functions provide a basis for teams of language and content teachers to work together to identify those means to scaffold learners into higher language cognition. So they provide a bridge between cognitive academic skills and the language needed to express them. So Again, we're going to go back to working with the teachers. And so after they did the comparative judgment activity, Anna, Tom, and Rachel went in and uh, did focus group discussions with the teachers and then also um, presented some of the, the work. So we'll be looking first at what the teachers discussed, um, thinking about the comparative judgment of the um, responses that the students provided for DEFINE. And these are from year six, what we just saw on ecosystems. So, you know, the first one, um, this was the lowest rated. It always got a zero. It's not structured as a def definition. There's no class um, and it's, it's simply not correct. Okay. Um, and then there's a lower rated one. It's structured as a diff definition at some space, but no class, there's no abstraction to it. Um, and then we can move along. Ex ecosystem includes all of the living things. Uh, so here we do get some abstractions, some generalizations. There's some scientific information, so some expansion, but it's missing the class. And then, you know, we can see the highest rated is this canonical definition that's expanded on. So um, the focus groups, the content and language teachers first discussed the results of their assessment in pairs, uh, and then they discussed it as a whole group with the researchers. And so this is a transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary approach to talking about the cognitive discourse functions because the teachers were not divided according to their discipline, but across disciplines. So you know, there were comments by the comment teacher, like ecosystem is not only the living things. Um, but content teachers also did comment on language because of the language. And I think it's got nothing to do with what an ecosystem is. The language teacher would mention the content. Okay, so yes, maybe I chose this one because of the way the content is organized. Um, also a higher rated one, they would say things like they're spelling mistakes, but I wouldn't mark it lower. So they're focusing on meaning as well, the language teachers. And then uh, the content and language teachers uh, design tasks in pairs. And then the content teachers, language teachers and researchers all discussed those tasks together. So for example, and again, here we're working transdisciplinarily. So this is a science teacher and an English teacher working together. And uh, they came up with, for example, for define, after just working on define, what the periodic table and the elements are. And then they choose an element and you know, then they go on to report on when it was discovered, why is it an important element? And uh, they work together to talk about, well, what kind of, language would we need to use to uh, be able to construct those different cognitive discourse functions. So again, teachers were working together there. Uh, and then, you know, the, the researchers would wrap up with some input. So this is an example of uh, a conversation at the end of a session and uh, on evaluate, which we saw earlier. And the researcher explains that what we want at school is specialized knowledge, you know, with the vision, the gaze of the specialist. Oh, by the way, this was in uh, Spanish and it's been translated into English, but the conversations happened in Spanish. Uh, so school knowledge produces this type of response, for example, 
Expansion of roads has negative consequences such as social crisis and political conflict. So, you know, what she explained that what we're seeing here are two things, the entities, the things that create knowledge in this area, like expansion, consequences, crisis, and conflicts. But they not only have these concepts and these abstractions of history, but there are several types. So then they need to be classified. Negative consequences, social crisis, political conflicts. So they have to know the abstractions, the entities, and also that many times there is a taxonomy of these concepts. So the dimensions of those entities. And not using those terms, uh, but using terms that the teachers are all familiar with. So we are learning to look at concepts and types of concepts that have to appear. So we need the concepts of the discipline, the classifications of the di disciplines. And when we evaluate, we expect a justification that would be recognized in the discipline. So again, thinking about those entities, the dimensions of the entities, and that uh, you know uh, th entities can be um, evaluated also. And so on the one hand, what we evaluate has to be recognized within our discipline. And there are different types of evaluations. Um, so this is the researcher talking to the teachers uh, about this work and about meaning. We've been seeing that really does affect how we assess the children's responses. So in the theory, and this is referring to systemic functional linguistic theory in which we work, we can evaluate for dif dif different reasons. We evaluate things, we judge people like most powerful families, he was the best emperor. And we evaluate what affects us emotionally. Like the girl who said, and this is referring to the data we also have on the children uh, writing about art, they compared to paintings. I love this painting because spring comes out green. And so depending on the subject and the topic, some will be more appropriate than others. And you will see what we have found in the different subjects. So that's alluding to the continuing work uh, that was being presented to the teachers uh, on the different cognitive discourse functions. And when something like uh, a personal expression of a, pers a personal uh, emotion, I love or I like something, can be relevant depending on what the subject is looking for, what this particular prompt is asking for, and what kind of um, uh, justification of that attitude is appropriate, again, given the context and situation. So that is a way of helping content and language teachers see uh, how language isn't just about being right or wrong, correct or incorrect, that again, it depends on the context of situation uh, that the, the children are writing in or speaking in. So this uh, focus on language and content integration has allowed that, that you know, we used this construct of cognitive discourse function, use systemic functional linguistic descriptors um, to, to characterize them, and then took it to the teachers to do that multidisciplinary assessment through comparative judgment, and then their discussions of comparative judgment and the generation of those activities they did in content and language which pairs, so that involved them in transdisciplinary work, and then uh, discussing those results in focus groups brings everybody together, talking about cognitive discourse functions and how they are constructed through language. So um, we feel that this uh, marriage between cognitive discourse functions and systemic functional linguistics um, make explicit these uh, disciplinary knowledge practices along with their linguistic realizations. So systemic functional linguistics, I mean, I think we all agree with this in this room, can help bridge disciplinary boundaries from the bottom up in educational contexts, creating new forms of activity which are thematic rather than disciplinary in their orientation. Um, we could discuss that word thematic because I don't know if we want to think of the cognitive discourse functions as themes, <clears throat> but uh, it, it gives uh, teachers a way of talking to each other using language uh, across disciplines.
And then teachers can make these understandings explicit to their students to help them fly. So to help them grow uh, from one year to the next. So thank you. And we can go on to questions, comments, discussion, applications. And uh, those are the references. And I'm happy to share the PowerPoint if anybody would like it. Thank you very much. Julie, wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Associate Professor and Mackay for such an amazing presentation. Wow. Yes, yeah, sure. After the conference, I will email everybody and ask the presenter if they are comfortable sharing their PowerPoints and PowerPoint slide and all the slide will be available on the website if they are happy to share. So we'll be in touch uh, with the last information. Thank you very much for your offer. Okay, now it's time for question, everyone. It's um, the last session of the day. So uh, if you feel uh, uh if you had no time pressure and feel comfortable to stay longer to engage with our wonderful end and then feel ready to continue the discussion as long as you like, I'm happy to stay <laughs> for longer than expected. So who, who would like to ask and first, any questions and comments about her, her speech? Okay, James, one question in the chat. Uh, Jim, uh, so I will read that, right? Uh, you would like to uh, ask the question hmm. directly? Hmm. It's, it's a great question. Hmm. Um, I Well, a part of it's political, okay? The one reason why the bilingual schools are often uh, perceived negatively is because uh, the... Um, political party that brought them into being in the Madrid region is the conservative party. And so a lot of people see it as, um, uh, you know, maybe sort of a, a, a way of getting people to, to vote for them, number one. Number two, there is a problem in the uh, secondary schools uh, with streaming. So at the end, the primary schools, a primary bilingual school, all of the children are in the bilingual uh, learning experiences throughout the day. When they get to secondary school, they're given an exam and it's a Cambridge exam, um, the pet and the cat. And based on their results, if they're in a bilingual secondary school, uh, they'll be in either a high immersion program where they have more subjects taught through the foreign language, um, especially science and uh, social science. So natural science and social science. If they're in the low exposure program, they do not get those subjects taught through the foreign language. Um, they typically would take art, uh, physical education, um, civic education or, or religious education if, if the school is offering that uh, through the foreign language. And so it does create a lack of equity um, that it might exacerbate already existing um, uh, examples of that. And so there's been research on that. So part of it is political. Uh, part of it is simply parents um, feeling like, okay, my, ch my child is learning through this foreign language and they come home and then we can't talk about history because they study it through another language. So there are numerous, oh, there are also teachers who feel that they're not as comfortable. Uh, and if a school becomes bilingual from, you know, some of these articles um, that uh, Idalva McCabe and um, Tom Ken looked at for their study, um, expressed these attitudes. Um, and so some teachers felt that, uh, you know, from one day to the next, all of a sudden they had to teach through English rather than Spanish. Well, that's a really interesting um, thing because uh, in Vietnam, uh, bilingual schools are highly regarded by parents and yeah, people in the society because parents would like to see their students success and uh, their, their children uh, to be successful and they highly appreciate um, the fact that their children are bilingual. So what you share in your talk is really interesting. It's uh, opposite and it's, it 
uh, is negative in Spain, but it's very positive in Vietnam, I think. Well, you do find those attitudes as well, man. Yeah. You know, I, I still remember being at uh, an open discussion with teachers from all over Spain because the bilingual schools, I talked about the Madrid region, but they're also in Andalusia and in other regions of Spain. And there was a teacher there from um, uh, an economically depressed area in Seville. And there was a pretty heated discussion going on about, uh, you know, will children actually learn history through English? You know, the, the focus seems to be on learning English, not learning the subject. And this teacher from this economically depressed area, he said, I'm a history teacher. And he said, I don't care if my kids learn history. I want them to learn English so that they can get ahead in life. And so, and that was an attitude from a, te a history teacher. So the, there, there is a wide range of attitudes. And, you know, periodically the press will um, bring up uh, those attitudes and write about them. I mean, what is the case is, yes, the program does need to be assessed, number one. And number two, uh, as one, uh, you know, is cited uh, in one of the newspapers, they, they don't have this linguistic scaffolding. You know, but they never thought about it even in their first language. You know, what is the language of history? What is the language in Spanish? Okay, so, um, you know, again, we see the benefits of a systemic functional linguistically based approach to education, um, whether it's a first language or a second language. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, ah, yeah. This is really interesting. The autonomy. <laughs> yes. uh, any further question, everyone? Uh, very interesting and meaningful research. Professor, thanks for sharing from Yamai and Zara. A really nice thank you there. Uh, she agrees. I order was you and other professors had done in this area. And I just wondered if anybody here would want to comment on cognitive discourse functions because. You know, we often, we, we talk, we discuss a lot that similarity with genres, the difference with genres. And if anybody has anything to say about that, they could say it here, or um, I appreciate views on uh, why we chose that con construct. And again, not working with genres. Mm, that's really interesting. Mm. I have, uh, has uh, anybody, uh... Well, I, I know it's the that? end of a long day for <laughs> conference goers. <laughs> yeah, from uh, this morning until now, six thirty. But we had uh, we had a, a longer break during the day, so it's not too bad. Yeah, I'm still okay. Right. Full of energy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, my goal. And probably would have loved to attend the school in Madrid. Are there potential tensions between? social media making and the notion of, ah, yes, that's a great question. Um, we are working on a um, chapter right now to come out in a book that's edited by Jamie Williams on systemic functional linguistics and the individual. Um, so yes, um, you're right, you know, systemic functional linguistic does focus much more on meaning as it's made in social interaction. And so in some ways, we're taking that back to the individual that, you know, what happens out there in the social interaction, in the classroom, in the way that teachers um, socialize their students in the classroom into uh, expressing uh, well, understanding and expressing the cognitive, well, in it, the content of their subject. Um, you know, that then we're asking children to then produce that individually, you know, so it, students need those individual understandings uh, and the capacity to express them in the language. So there, I, there is, potential tension, but I also do think, you know, if you think about um, um, Halliday and Matheson's book on language and cognition, I can't remember the title right now, 
you know, that I think Michael Halliday said something like we see, you know, we get at cognition through language. Now, it is the case that a student can come up with a perfect canonical definition, but it could just be copied from the textbook. So there is tension there. You know, I think obviously we know that um, that an ability to say something doesn't always mean that we know it. And, and that's where I think legitimation code theory provides an interesting interface because, you know, then we can ask, well, can children unpack what that definition means or, you know, what their evaluation really means? Um, so there is tension, but I think it's a good tension. So that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for this uh, the question and, and for the answer. Okay, it's uh, six thirty three now. As we still pass the time, but uh, if you have any further comments, please feel free to continue for a few minutes. Okay. Any further thoughts? <laughs> okay. Perhaps uh, uh, you would like to have right now. Okay. Thank you, Sato. So let's thank um uh, our wonderful very speaker again for all her hard work and. Uh, uh for getting up so early to deliver this bit now and then uh you can enjoy the rest of your day teaching and <laughs> thank you so much again for joining us and for your support and thanks to everyone um for uh supporting the conference and for attending the conference for the whole day today oh and tomorrow is the last day i will say well, thank that. you okay. thank you all for being here and thank you Vin, for a wonderful conference and and all your enthusiasm and energy it uh, it really is uh, uh you know wonderful inspiration for all of us so yeah. thank you <laughs> i love okay. i love our community thank you everyone and see you again tomorrow okay bye and bye, bye everybody thank you bye. thanks jim bye. okay yeah I'll go teach my classes now. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully that you will in your place. Well, I'm at home now. Okay. So I'll go, okay. I'll go to the university. Okay. I'll go to the university now. Okay. Okay. Well, have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. And you have a wonderful day. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you, Ty. Bye-bye, Ty. Thank you for sharing the session uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Ben. See you later. Thank you, Jim. See you later. Oh, no. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording and, and the meeting now. <laughs>